Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, welcome to another CIO East Africa webinar. Uh, and today, um, our focus is going to be on successful online learning. We know that um, given the current situation, we have all been forced to go online, but that does not mean that we stop learning. Um, learning is an integral part of our lives. And in fact, um, for me, from a personal perspective, I've been telling my team that it, if there is no there is no time like the present um, to be able to um, focus on some personal development because of the online opportunities that are available today. But on the other hand, there are a few challenges when it comes to online learning. Um, those of you who are parents, you know what is happening um, in your homes with regards to your children. Um, there's been a lot of teething problems with um, how to get them um, to focus um, successfully during a lesson, um, you had to invest in technology. Um, there's this whole discussion on how do you work as well as uh, supervise your children um, from a learning perspective? Are the teachers prepared um, and are we prepared as a country? Or in fact, um, as are we prepared globally for online learning? In our current situation, we do not know how long this pandemic um, will go on. So we need to get used to it and get used to the fact that um, online learning is going to be a new way of doing things and it's going to be here um, to stay. And even from an organizational perspective, um, there's also got to be some kind of skills building that has to continue um, going on. So how do we make sure that um, successfully um, our teams are picking up skills and taking advantage of online learning opportunities that do exist. Um, and even when you look at higher learning institutions, how do they make sure that they deliver um, lessons and are able to um, administer exams at the same time? From a personal perspective, I've spent the whole week um, supervising my niece who's doing um, her final exams um, for um, primary school. Um, and she's supposed to start high school in September. And uh, we've had to do her exams online because um, they've not been postponed. Um, she's been preparing and, and it's time for her to take her exams. And it's been a very interesting um, experience because I've had to sign when she starts, I've had to sign when she finishes, and then I have to scan the documents and send them, um, send her exam paper um, to the markers. And, um, and this way we'll be able to get the results in exactly a week. But again, on the back end of that, um, she's supposed to be going away to boarding school. And the question is, what is she going to do come September? Will school be open? So, you know, some interesting stuff going on, but life must go on um, and we must continue learning. So today I'm not your host. Um, I'm just doing the intro. I am going to hand over to the moderator, who's uh, Michael Michier. We have a very interesting lineup of speakers. Um, just like you who are online, I'm looking forward to learning quite a bit on, on, you know, what does successful online learning look like. So, Michael, over to you um, and as you take us through the session. Um, just before I hand over to you, Michael, house rules as usual, please uh, let's engage the public chat window. If you can't hear anything, if you can't see anything, questions will be posted in the Q&A window. We will answer after all the presenters go through their sessions. You will forgive us if we have to extend the time a little bit because we have a whole host of speakers and we look forward to an engaging session. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Laura, that was a good summary. I don't think there's much I'd add on to that, other than just probably my own personal challenges that I've faced with online learning is you just find yourself picking up one too many classes. So I found myself suddenly with 14 classes that I think I can finish within the year. Probably best to just do five of them. But really interesting topic, and we have a great session of panelists and presenters here. I'd like to go straight off to Ada, sorry, to Mushemi. Uh, Mushemi is the founder of Serious Consult. Uh, this is a technology led organizational transformation. Sorry, uh, Mushemi leads, uh, he's the founder of Serious Consult, which uh, is a technology led organizational transformational uh, consultancy. Uh, Mushemi, welcome. Uh, please take us to your presentation. Thank you, Michael. Thank you once again, CIO, for inviting me. Um, a while back, just like uh, Laura was saying, I found myself looking at 
my children and wondering how they were doing school because school was closed. Um, I have uh, young adult kids and um, in their schools, there was so much that was being put through. And I wondered whether the, the tools or the need for them to understand the landscape for which they were working on were being considered. So based on the kind of background I have in technology, it said that maybe I should write about what I think are some of the key things that people should consider while their kids are going online so that that way you can create a discussion and also bring forward some things that we may have or, or are considering as, as, as stakeholders. So what I did is I put together five, five points that I want to walk you through. So this is a fairly short, this short, um, short presentation. So just to give it some context, uh, Ministry of Education released the emergency plan of 2020. And in it, they said that there are 18 million uh, schools, uh, 18 million children in school right now in Kenya. Uh, as we know, World Bank has released some figures and said that there are probably 1.6 billion kids who are going to school right now. And out of those, we have 90,000 schools and over 300,000 teachers. Now, you can imagine the number of people outside of a structured environment when COVID hit. All these people uh, were now working from home. So what are those challenges that we'll be facing? The first thing I think that we, we see is safeguarding and technology. By safeguarding, I mean, <clears throat> you look at kids and there's a lot of shaming, uh, cyberbullying, gang-related activities, extremism, and all of that. And so we need to be able to create an environment which is free or that protects kids from these kinds of uh, uh, opportunities uh, to hurt them online. But the second thing also is the technology that is being used. We need to look at, uh, right now, many kids who are predominantly from the public sector schools did not have the machinery to be able to engage online. Yet in a heartbeat, all of us are supposed to be working online. So now the question then is, is, is asked about how are those kids being prepared to work in that environment? What are the tools that they are being given? Uh, I know there was a program that was started to, to start rolling out technology, uh, technology uh, devices, but that is still not yet enough considering the fact that we don't have the infrastructure also available to be able to accommodate all these uh, students online. And obviously there's a cost associated with it. And the more rural the schools, the harder it is to, to get the services that are required to engage with the learning process. The second thing I looked at was the online communication and etiquette. And I'm sure all of us have a story to tell about some people who have behaved either inappropriately or without the knowledge that they were being watched. This business of their eyes everywhere is something that is a challenge to a lot of people, a lot of folks, and people have had to adjust as quickly as is possible to understand how to communicate online. But now communication is not only from the students, but also how do the schools communicate to the students? Laura just said about how she was preparing her niece. I was also preparing my son and my daughter in the same scenario. And we were wondering in the cases where we usually go to school to get um, the updates on how your children are doing, right now all those updates are done online. And so the tools that are required to communicate correctly with the stakeholders should be enhanced. The second part is also now the etiquette of behavior in an online environment. While as kids used to run around and make noise in class, now you have an extrapolated uh, what you call the environment that is actually shining the light on individual kids and how they are behaving online. So there's a need for education there for either the students or the teachers, as well as the parents to understand what this new medium should look like. The third is <clears throat> the learning at home structure. Now, many of, uh, I remember when my kids were going to school, they'd leave 
And of course, you delegate your responsibility or your day-to-day -day responsibility to the teacher in the school environment. Now that school environment has come into your house. So many of us have webinars such as this one that we have right now, and the kids are in another room going to, to school. So how are you able to update and monitor and create the time that is required for them to either expend their energy outside of a school learning environment or to engage with you in a manner that will add value to your bonding experience within your family. The fourth area that I looked at uh, in my discussion was uh, health and wellness. Yeah, health and wellness is something that is becoming a huge talking point. The reason is because there's so much work coming and before the system can become comfortable in how much the students can take, how much they can use and how much they can manage their time, there's going to be an inflow of more information than there actually is less. And therefore, we need to think about how do you create an environment for which these children are able to expand their energies, but at the same time be able to learn. And um, there are lots of uh, what you call uh, psychological issues that are faced within the house, some households. And so we need to make sure that those children are able to uh, be able to accommodate the kinds of challenges that are going to be coming from other quarters outside of the learning institution quarters. The last one that I looked at was looking at an in inclusive online learning ecosystem. And this one actually pairs the parents with the, with the school systems, with the students, with the teachers, and with the government institutions. And that ecosystem is very fragile because all of a sudden, everybody has to play their part, either from a content creation process, from a learning, uh, learning and, and development perspective, to an infrastructure ability to accommodate the new changes online, as well as the monitoring and evaluation system. So by looking at all these strategies, I think the environment needs to take um, note on everything that is required to be done so that then we can promote the, the wealth, health and wealth being of our children. So I want to stop there just to create a, a, a discussion point and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Experiencing the most is that learning curve. I think the change, especially because it was quite abrupt, it's not a migration that we did within months or years. It was just within a few weeks, all of a sudden schools across the world just had to adapt to online learning. So I'm going to call on to my next speaker, Adam Lin. Adam is the deputy CEO at Huawei Kenya. Adam, the floor is yours. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Adam and I'm very happy to be talking to you today. I think many of you will know about Huawei um, as one of the global leaders in technology industry. Uh, we've been in Kenya now for over 20 years and working all around the world. Um, very highly uh, R&D intensive company, more than half our employees actually work in R&D. Um, I will, as you know, we, we cover various aspects of the technology industry from the consumer products in terms of smartphones, tablets, and so on, to the, the infrastructure for both telcos, um, such as 3G, 4G, 5G, fiber, and so on, as well as infrastructure for businesses and governments, which includes IT infrastructure, as well as um, communications infrastructure like NOFB, which um, the Kenyan government uses here. And we also have Huawei Cloud as well. So this is a, just a snapshot about where Huawei fits into this. We're not a software company necessarily. We're not a content company. We're not an um, internet company in the sense we don't make money off adverts or of data. We basically sell um, hardware as much as we can with some software related to that. Um, and that and that's, now, in terms of skills, um, we've been focusing a lot in skilling uh, Kenyans uh, at all different levels. So we've kind of split it into four different groups. I think digital skills are very important to do education. Uh, so we have a, a consumers or citizens, I suppose, in general, uh, how to use smartphones, for example, um, how to use the internet, how to use computers, very basic stuff. How can you then transact online? How can you look for information online and so on? We then do a lot for youth as well, a bit more advanced training. Uh, how can they maybe get jobs online? Um, you know, looking for jobs, how can they maybe sell some things online for some basic e-commerce and so on? Um, then we have programs for students, obviously more advanced uh, to really accompany and um, support their academic studies. Uh, we have the Huawei certified courses 
uh, network associate, internet associate, and so on in various different topics. Uh, you can see some of the numbers here. We work closely with over 30 different uh, academic partners in Kenya to deliver these programs through lecturers. We train lecturers for free. The lecturers then are able to train their students and they get certified if they pass. So we're actually very excited that last year we launched the AI training program in Kenya for the first time. I think six different universities now are doing that, even online now as we speak. Um, and we've also uh, started to work more on civil um, civil servant government training programs as well as we as well. And this comes into the the professional category, where we also have our East Africa training center based in Kenya. Uh, we have our graduate training program, a lot of internship programs as well. So it's just a snapshot, I think, of the what we need to think about at a national level, how we build the relevant skills for education, but also for work in the future as well. Um, I, just briefly, in terms of uh, COVID and what we've been doing, our main focus has been enabling the distance education. Uh, we're working closely with UNESCO, a part of their Global Education Coalition, uh, has been formed during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, and to do this, uh, we've been working with many different uh, uh, universities. Uh, we've been providing actually cash to support airtime uh, and data bundles for some of the students, um, providing our online uh, video conference software for students and lecturers to use. I currently have over 600 students enrolled during the COVID period um, and eight different online classes in, in different areas. Uh, we're also helping lecturers discuss and hold workshops, share best practices about how they can teach effectively online because for some of them it's quite new. Uh, and of course, a lot of our courses also involve remote access to certain technologies. Um, so you can actually remotely do some networking um, by tapping into uh, those cloud-based uh, resources and so on. So it's, it's very interesting how I've had to adapt a little bit. Of course, we're, we've been having a, a bit an online pla learning platform anyway before COVID uh, for all of our content. So that's just been adapted and enhanced a little bit. Um, now, I mentioned earlier a bit about some of our skills program. I just want to touch on one program, which is called the DigiTruck, um, which was launched at the end of last year in Kenya. Um, there are others around the world that other NGOs have done as well. And um, this is something that we have been using in Nandi, Bomet, as well as Machakos. It's currently on pause during COVID, but hopefully it will be able to move again, uh, depending on what, what happens with the school situation, to teach um, youth digital skills. It uh, has internet through 4G um, and a, a we call it a CPE, basically a, a modem or a router on the outside of the truck, as well as laptops, smartphones, and VR headsets as well. It's fully solar powered. So it's quite an interesting initiative, it's, but we're hoping to also be able to use this to go out to some of the remote schools and start to teach teachers as well as part of the, the DLP program too. Um, some of our partners here in terms of the trainers, the curriculum, and others. Um, now, I just take uh, five minutes or so to talk a bit about the education challenges and what we see as some of the solution, I guess, from a technology perspective. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because you see these challenges before COVID and, of course, exacerbated during COVID. So, of course, typically we know there are huge gaps between different regions and different conditions between private and public schools, between those in rural areas, those in more in urban areas. We see a lack of resources from things such as desks and textbooks, unfortunately, as well as, of course, physical buildings, and even power and so on, and large class sizes. And of course, a lack of certain equipment, you know, in, when we talk about technology, a lack of computers, but a lack of science labs and so on. Now, during COVID, of course, some of these students have been able to learn online, whether it's the KSAD uh, online um, in curriculum uh, through TV or radio, or whether it's private schools and other interactive curriculum as well. Um, but that's actually exacerbating some of the challenges in the country as many students are unable to access the internet, don't have devices or can't afford it, or their public schools are not very proactive. So you really have to develop it on themselves. And that's a major challenge. The second, of course, the education model. Uh, Kenya is, of course, moving to the competency-based curriculum, trying to develop more interactive and experiential learning, though it's not easy. It's very difficult to train. I think three, I had 317,000 teachers across the country uh, in primary and secondary schooling. And how to use technology for enhanced and added content. You know, how do you explore the world through the internet to aid with geography lessons? How could you use AR or VR to enhance with history lessons, for example? Uh, and much more beyond. And now during the COVID time, of course, we have to make sure that learning, if it's online, is safe, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, interactive still um, and relevant. You know, what, what's suitable for the age of the children and their own individ individual capability. There's some very interesting trends now where 
where software is using artificial intelligence to adapt to a student's capabilities uh, and give them the content based on what they're able to do. And the third one is on the management side. So of course, this is um, sort of being developed with NEMIS in Kenya to help sort of work out which teachers are at school, which students are at school and so on. But there's not, it's a very basic, simple question, um, simple problem that hasn't quite been addressed yet in the public sector. Um, and now, of course, during COVID-19, who knows actually which students are learning online, who is logging into the online portal or listening to the TV and radio shows and so on. So that management side is very, very important in knowing and adapting to different learners. So these are just some of the challenges. Now, when we look at smart edu, uh, when we look at pre-COVID, uh, Huawei did some research in, in various places across the country where areas are connected in urban areas, areas are connected in rural areas and also unconnected areas too, though I've not got that data here. And we see that actually a lot of Kenyans were using the internet for education purposes. As uh, you can see, actually, uh, in rural areas, even more so than urban areas, uh, maybe because schooling is weaker there uh, and uh, there are less other options in terms of tutors or other extracurricular activities. Uh, so actually, the numbers are quite high. Um, we look at this as a very large number of people that were looking using the Internet. And this was done in October 2019. Um, and we looked when we asked the question, you know, you can't take this, take this with a pinch of salt. If you had a thousand shillings, how would you spend that? on the internet, what would you use that airtime for, for example? You see, actually education is the biggest one that comes out here. Um, people would spend more of their thousand shillings on accessing education opportunities more than any other. So it does actually offer a business opportunity. And we've seen, obviously, especially the last three months, a very large uptake or very large growth amongst the Kenyan startups who are providing educational content, curriculum, online learning, and so on to kind of prove that. And I think there is a business case there. Uh, when it comes to smart learning, uh, from Huawei's perspective, we look at it in four different kind of categories. There's that, the campus infrastructure. Obviously, that could be Wi-Fi network, for example. Um, it could also include the solar power, uh, may include safety and security cameras too. Then, of course, there's the connectivity itself, whether it's through mobile, whether it's through fiber and other aspects. And, of course, there's the content that will be hosted on a cloud. Um, it could be partly on a local server. It could also be remote. It could be a combination through a fusion or hybrid cloud process. And then of course, there's the applications, whether they're personal applications like smartphones or tablets or school-based um, devices, you know, such as uh, smart boards and so on. And this is both for the teaching and learning side, but also for the management side too. Um, and if I move on to the next slide, um, I also want to explain a bit about the interactive learning solutions and platforms. Obviously, you could talk for hours about these platforms and the different aspects of them. And there's a, a broad range of different functions, as I'll talk about in the on the final slide. But certainly, a key aspect is what the teachers can do in terms of before and after class, uh, creating their content, uploading their content, uh, being able to support students individually. Of course, there's the students themselves being able to access and prepare before class, doing homework after class. Uh, as well as obviously what actually happens during class itself, uh, where you would have, you know, promoting and sharing content to students. Um, if you're doing uh, synchronous or asynchronous based courses, i.e. live or not live, publishing tests or polls, for example, to check students are learning during the class itself, having some kind of interactive, either physical and virtual or combination of both a physical smart board that's also obviously accessible online or you can do real-time document editing students as well as teachers uh, can be doing it just like they're in class uh, and that's very important so this is just kind of a quick snapshot and summary of this of course you can download this in the handout section and lastly then um, my final slide just to explain a bit about what we see at the moment during covid um, from a technology perspective you know i think we're, we're in stage one at the moment uh, where there's no learning really happening physically online learning or tv and radio is the only option um there's going to be a stage two i think uh, especially now that the government's looking at having smaller class sizes when schools go back if it's september 1st or separately uh, which means you actually need to have online learning and classroom learning synchronized um, we've seen in many countries in europe where some students take it in turns to go to school you know 20 kids this day 20 kids that day or some in the morning some in the afternoon or one week on one week off uh, and that makes life very complicated if you are only doing offline, um, so it's going to be really, really tricky. So how do you kind of synchronize online and offline? Um, and then, of course, ultimately, there'll be stage three where hopefully things kind of go back to normal. But we are still enhancing our physical education with the online aspect as well, just like, in a sense, pre-COVID was aiming to do. Um, now, when we look at um, possible uh, solutions, you know, at the moment, 
uh, KACD has a lot of content that's online books. Uh, there's some games, there's some videos, some of it's quite static. Uh, some of it's a bit more interactive. There's other publishers and Kenyan companies with that. Uh, ultimately, of course, people also need um, online worksheets, online tests, probably not online exams at this point, um, live video lessons. They're really the only way, I think, to really engage students and check if students are actually learning or not and to answer questions. The interactive whiteboard I mentioned, Q&A with students and teachers, um, a live editing student records to see which students logged in and signed in, um, as well as, of course, group discussion between students themselves, not only between students and the teachers. And of course, the device aspect is really exciting that Safaricom has announced. I don't think it's public yet, but they're going to start trying to offer uh, devices, at least smartphones, uh, on credit, and you'll be able to lock those smartphones remotely if people are not paying for them, um, which is exciting. And maybe that can be expanded in the future to tablets, seven or ten inch tablets. And we're also having similar conversations with different partners around whether Huawei devices could do that as well in the future. Um, now, we really think online live learning is very important, um, and I know that's not really happening in the public sector, at least not um, officially. Though I think some teachers are doing it on their own back. Uh, there are some of the private sectors doing it, I guess, because they need to kind of verify, uh, justify their school fees. We think live learning is very important. And there's these three kind of key questions that we think need to be addressed. And then I'll, I'll wrap up my presentation. Um, the first thing, is it really necessary um, for teaching to be um, online um, and for teachers to be using schools? Uh, I don't think teachers can teach from home. Uh, they need this quiet environment, they need reliable power and reliable connectivity. Uh, and that's, I think, important. You know, they can still have social distancing with one or two teachers per classroom, for example. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be in schools. I guess you could go to other buildings um, at where there is internet. Um, through NOFBI, the government's connected hundreds of government buildings around the country, um, as well as, of course, many, most almost all universities as well, and some TVETs. So those can be the base where teachers can use for live learning. It doesn't have to be every single school, um, but it could be something, you know, five or ten schools per county or something like this. Um, and, of course, if you haven't got uh, fibre internet, such as NOFBI or through a commercial provider, we can, you can use what we call fixed wireless access, which is what you saw on the DigiTruck, basically using a hotspot from a mobile device or a mobile uh, dongle or router, something like that. And finally, I guess the key question we have to work on um, is, of course, the data costs for students uh, and whether video conference platforms which can use one, two gigabytes of data potentially per hour uh, should be maybe zero rated or at a very cheap, affordable price uh, by the mobile network operators. And I know some of them are doing some initiatives at the moment, um, but I think those are the, th the kind of questions that we need to be exploring. Um, for the future. So uh, I think I've reached the end of my time. Um, so I look forward to answering some of your questions later. Thank you very much. The interactive learning versus the live learning, because I think we've all, or most of us have experienced the challenge with the live learning. There's always a connectivity drop or infrastructure is not that good. And then there's the issue of time because it's quite schedule based. So you really have to be there on time. Otherwise you miss the class. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite invite Saido. Saido is the Education Chief at UNESCO offices uh, within East Africa. Uh, Saido, are you ready? My name is Saido Jalo, and I am the Education Chief for the uh, UNESCO Regional Office for Eastern Africa. Uh, let me just say that um, I'm very honored to be uh, part of this uh, event and um, representing UNESCO here. Um, I would like to say also that the uh, presentation would basically focus on uh, um, how governments and uh, UN uh, partners, our development partners and, uh, and technology partners have, um, have uh, come together to, see, to respond to the uh, COVID uh, or the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the education sector, particularly the closure of schools um yeah so and other learning centers it would be uh, useful to look at uh, just just as a quick look at uh, some of the uh, impacts on schools closure uh, number of students affected in the eastern africa region um as of march 2020 according to data from the unesco institute for statistics um we have about uh, uh, total number of enrolled students preschool to secondary of over half uh, 130 million um enrolled at higher education students uh, uh upwards of 26 million 
And um, over the period between March, when close school closures uh, particularly started, especially in, in Kenya and most of the other countries in uh, Eastern Africa, um, since then up to now, some of the countries have been contemplating, particularly around now, contemplating a lot about reopening of schools. So uh, I just thought I would put in uh, two or three uh, countries which uh, have a scheduled uh, reopening of schools, as you can see there. Uh, Seychelles, Mauritius, and Djibouti uh, are all looking at uh, opening schools, uh, some mid-May, for example, Seychelles. Uh, they, are, they were less hit by the uh, uh, COVID, by the, uh, um, the coronavirus. Um, there's Mauritius, uh, they're planning for August, and Djibouti reopened, uh, focusing on higher education in mid-May. Of course, which, who, whichever country opens, would this would be followed with... Um, uh, guidelines, uh, health guidelines, and, and and so on. With the closure of schools, uh, governments are were very uh, interested, uh, concerned about continuing education. Obviously, there would be a loss of education um, as a result of the closures. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, governments were very concerned, uh, as well as partners all over with the UN in here. UNESCO particularly was also very concerned about uh, what uh, uh, could be lost in terms of uh, the education that had already been acquired and that which we, we would lose during the period of the COVID. Uh, so the countries, uh, most of them uh, adopted uh, different solutions, uh, but basically all of them uh, opted to use some form of technology, uh, obviously from the low, very low to the very high. Um, examples there, several countries, some of them have printed printed lessons on hard paper, hard copy, and distributed to children. Um, very popular and widely used is radio and TV platforms. Uh, uh, they are media-based uh, platforms for, for edu to deliver the curriculum. Um, some use online, a few of them, but it is available uh, online digital platforms for online learning and teaching, and the more advanced technologies of cloud-based technologies like the Kedia Education Cloud. So I'll be giving some examples from Kenya, but basically some of them are, uh, may refer to other countries around the region here. So uh, uh, you bear with me. Most of these technologies have issues. Given the context of the region, the context uh, in, in which we are in, uh, quite apart from the, the effects of uh, the COVID, but um, overall, uh, given the COVID and now, there are there are several challenges to the to the uh, solutions that governments are available to governments or they have opted to use for now. For example, radio and TV, um, the problem, the challenge there, the challenges there include appropriately produced lessons. Uh, they are not, uh, they may not be there. Uh, trained teachers, uh, inactivity of lessons. Um, uh, and coverage are all issues. Uh, these uh, the lessons teachers would find it difficult to interact live with students on the TV and radio uh, platforms, if if you like. Teachers, some teachers are not very keen. Uh, we we know of this in many countries. We do reports of that. Teachers are not very keen to use uh, TV or radio uh, to to deliver lessons. They don't have the the, the capacity is not there. Uh, there is also the issue of uh, infrastructure. Uh, most of the countries in our regions have limited infrastructures. Kenya is really, uh, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, and uh, probably one or two others uh, are, are better endowed with the with infrastructure and um, access to the internet, for example, connectivity and so on. But uh, overall, there is this issue. And even in Kenya, this infrastructure, it doesn't cover the whole country. Now, bandwidth limitations and affordability of data bundles, um, I think Adam mentioned about data bundles in his uh, in the previous uh, presentation, but this is a this is a, a, a limitation. Um, bandwidth also uh, affects the obviously the the kind of uh, um, platform you will use. Uh, low bandwidth. Some of them don't uh, <clears throat> don't uh, sit well with low very low bandwidth. And um, you talk about bandwidth where you can have access to the infrastructure. Uh, some parts of the country or the countries uh, we cover, uh, there are parts that do not have this uh, infrastructure. So that was, we don't talk about bandwidth issues. Um, there are also with um, the uh, online uh, online and indeed offline solutions, uh, there is a scarcity of hardware, uh, laptop servers and mobile access devices of, of the learners and teachers require to be able to connect to the internet. There's also a shortage of digitized textbooks. 
uh, digitized curricula and teaching and learning materials or resources. Uh, there's a shortage there. Uh, another challenge is a very minimal offline service and learning resources are available to these countries. Um, distribution of uh, printed versions of online lessons, this is difficult to do and expensive also to do. If you do them, you have to transport them over to the rural areas where they are needed and um, distribute them to, 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 to learners and teachers as well. Um, the, for the Kenya Education Cloud, uh, this cannot be accessed by all learners. Um, so it, uh, it, it, it uh, therefore is a solution very good. If it can be expanded to cover everybody, beautiful, wonderful. But at the moment, it is not covering all the students. So some students are left out. And um, we, we are just like governments in the region and in Kenya are concerned about students being left out of the education process, students not having the same access to education, which is their right um, uh, 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 happening. The, 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 the another basic, basic, very basic um, uh, challenge is the power uh, uh, supply, power, uh, in, uh, the power infrastructure that also creates some challenges. During this period, around February, March, um, we, we, uh, we, are, we, are, we are requested to by the UN uh, in Kenya here to work together among within UN agencies like UNICEF, UNHCR, the World Food Program, to work together and see how we can support the government in Kenya to ensure that learning continues during the COVID period. So, um, but within that context, at a larger context, we had um, mobilized uh, partners and uh, decided to bring them together and see what can be done to support the countries to continue education, uh, both with during and after COVID. So um, we tapped into the Global Coalition for Education that our UNESCO headquarters had uh, mobilized uh, IT partners. Huawei is one major one of them, Microsoft is another, and a few others to come together and see how they can support the country. So we had our own call. We, we tapped from that, uh, that Global Coalition and um, uh, decided to engage the partners these IT partners, some of them are in, uh, indicated on the, in this slide at the, the, the box uh, at the bottom, Huawei, Microsoft, Google, uh, CD networks, et cetera, et cetera, Curious Learning, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we have had engagements, uh, country level engagements with uh, countries uh, listed here, South Sudan, at, at that at, at that time, Uganda, Madagascar, Comoros, Kenya, Seychelles, we did uh, yesterday, uh, uh, two days ago, on the 23rd, and we plan to do Rwanda this coming Friday. That's uh, tomorrow. So basically, uh, this slide is just to show some of the, the, the this background information and that uh, we're working very closely with Huawei, uh, particularly uh, they are very present in Eastern Africa and particularly in Kenya. So we are working with them very closely on, uh, on higher education and so on. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, on, on, on there. The other thing is a webinar on higher education, uh, which we had done uh, with uh, the our office in Abuja, which was a continental one, and on higher education. So uh, we, during the engagements uh, with these countries, there who are we some uh, partners would, would 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 indicate what they can do, what is available. All right. Sometimes it's uh, pro bono. Or that is pro bono for a period of time, but the important thing is they would share with the countries and uh, other partners to show what is possible, so that countries would determine what is what they can handle, what they can take, and how to go about it. So this is uh, going on with with Huawei. We uh, they, 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 there is this offer on training of AI, training on artificial intelligence and digital innovation for university teachers and TV instructors, and um, we want to we want to use that uh, offer to see how we do that in Ethiopia, Mauritius, Kenya, Uganda, uh, Tanzania, Rwanda. Um, we are also uh, discussing with them, in discussion with them, particularly uh, with uh, Lintuo. I, I suppose Adam would know Lintuo. Um, on, a, on, on a network of uh, hubs, uh, learning hubs, uh, which would link universities and teacher training institutions to reach up to 300 universities in the Eastern Africa area. Now we are working on the agreement on getting this to move on. Microsoft has offered um, pro bono the use of its uh, Teams platform, Office 365, um, free to countries to be used in teaching and learning and capacity building of teachers. Uh, we want to, some countries are, are, are working with um, JE, uh, and, and, and her team 
to uh, to see how this can be done in South Sudan and um, Kenya here, of course, Uganda, Madagascar. We want to spread this over right across. And from KIDC, KIDC had mentioned that uh, all already 650 teachers already trained in the use of the the, the Teams uh, Microsoft this team platform um, in teaching. There's also the uh, the Smart University Hamdan you know, focusing on the teaching of, uh, the training of teachers uh, for remote teaching. So teachers, I earlier said, have, they don't seem to have the capacity to do that. They need to be taught how to do that because we are all, uh, in addition to the education system, we are all caught unawares. Uh, we are not caught, uh, not ready to handle what we have to handle. There are areas that um, some of these, uh, okay, still coming with some, there's common of learning, also focus on capacity building um, of uh, teachers and TV instructors, and there are countries where we want to use them, uh, work with the countries. Elumu is a, is a, is a, is a group that um, looks at offline intranet resources, and these offline resources are, can be very useful um, in areas which are not, at the moment, reached by the infrastructure, the various infrastructures, be it uh, internet, uh, connectivity, or power infrastructure. And, the, uh, and then, of course, the UNESCO UNICEF, UNICR, too, we are teaming up to see how we have a, established a regional hub of knowledge, uh, knowledge, information and knowledge on teaching and learning resources covering all the range of uh, education. We, we thought we should raise uh, some areas where there need to be gaps to be filled or potential for scaling up, uh, that, 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 you know. So we have the, starting with the mass media based solutions, um, TV, radio, and so on. If, if we can have a way of in, increasing their interactivity between the teacher and the students. So a teacher and student, the teacher can do some assessment, uh, assessing learning outcomes as they go, uh, that would uh, increase the utility of these two media-based platforms. The online solutions or platforms, uh, there obviously is the need for expansion of the, the, the infrastructures uh, for internet. Um, uh, I, I, I have learned of uh, the, the government in Kenya planning to expand the 4G network right across the country, and that would be excellent uh, as it will bring enable students out there to connect. Of course, energy infrastructure as well is there, but um, fortunately there is an option of solar energy, which could also be tapped, but that also requires some equipment, hardware, and so on that have to be put together. Um, still on online solutions, we need to access, expand the access to hardware, the, the hardware, the servers, et cetera, et cetera. The other issue with uh, online resources, uh, online solutions, which we need to, to, to uh, address during this COVID and uh, actually even post COVID is the, digi uh, the digitization of curriculum textbooks and other teaching and learning materials. Some digitization session has gone on in Kenya, but there are still more. KICD is still requesting that um, they would need further support on digitization of uh, um, learning resources, uh, textbooks, etc., etc. And of course, there's the psychosocial support platforms and content, which is very important, particularly where we have students learning from home, away from the school, uh, so in some countries, locked down, complete. So uh, sitting around for several months now, since March, uh, this seems to have some pressure um, on, on, on learners, on children, even us who work from home, we have our own pressures, but uh, talk less about students. And on the offline solutions, uh, there is need to really explore how this can be expanded or elaborated. The one of the similar uh, uh, um, in, uh, initiative that um, I think Adam mentioned, the Digitruck, which we are working with them to see how we uh, utilize it in Kenya here, and then subsequently in other countries in the Eastern Africa region, uh, it's important to 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 expand this uh, uh, so that uh, there's a you have a network of 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 intranet if you like tapping from the internet from somewhere and then putting it within a within a uh, uh, within a Wi-Fi within a within a some local cloud if you like and tapping from there um, without. Uh, direct contact, continuous connection uh, to the internet. And this would be very useful also to difficult to hard to reach areas as well as uh, rural and refugee areas where um, you don't have this infrastructure or in areas where refugee areas where you have people who cannot afford some of other things. Now, uh, I'd like to conclude by saying that um, it's, it's likely that this coronavirus will stay with us for a long time and uh, may rise to pandemic levels in the future. One never knows, uh, but it's, it's important to plan for them, to prepare for uh, the other one that will come. Uh, so uh, in this regard, we 
it is it it is very clear that um, the teaching and learning will be impacted. The way we are going to teach and learn from now on, uh, from post COVID, if you like, during a post COVID, could be a blend of online, um, face to face, uh, perhaps. Uh, but it will be impacted, and the governments will have to really and partners, IT partners, have to come to 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 together uh, to see how this can be done. Technology partners support is coming. Uh, and, 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 and I'd like to use this opportunity to thank all the IT partners of the Global Coalition and those outside the Global Coalition who have joined us as well, um, to thank them for their support. Uh, some are giving pro bono, others are, um, others are giving it for a time. Uh, the other thing is that uh, governments will need to adopt a combination of solutions from low to high technologies, because governments uh, would have to provide infrastructures that's the responsibility of government to provide infrastructures, and that may take time. And um, in the meantime, uh, I think uh, it, 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 a combination of solutions we need governments to consider that take that. Now, it is crucial that in anything we do in education, we cover all learners in any country. These are issues of equity in education. SDG 4, the fundamental principle under SDG 4 is leaving no child behind. Now, unless we cater for all students within the territory of our country, we will not be able to achieve this this uh, this this uh, this principle of uh, um, uh, leaving no one behind. So this has an issue of uh, equity, and um, there is the also uh, an issue with international cooperation. Uh, actually, not an issue really, but um, the international SDG for SDG 17, uh, which focuses on um, international cooperation, is now very very relevant and must be tapped. So that uh, we'll use that also to call on all partners all partners uh, at all levels, wherever they are, to, to come in and see how we can move the, this, this agenda forward and move uh, uh, facilitated countries to be able to, to deliver their curricular education to continue so that children do not miss too much. I think that's about, that will be the last slide. Um, the other one is just to thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you and merci. Over to you, Michael. Put into perspective just the scale at which uh, the pandemic has hampered education and also the magnitude of effort required by all the stakeholders involved just to to ride through this storm and probably even readjust and reconstruct how education systems and the curriculum itself is built. I think in particular when you mentioned just the, the digitization of the curricula, which I believe would be a great challenge for most institutions. Yeah. And I think what when you mentioned the SDG4 on mm. equity, I think that is something which probably in the own stretch since March we've suffered from not being able to do that. But let's hope uh, all the governments are able will be able to sort that one out. Mm.